call this meeting to order. Uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Let's see. Uh, welcome to the August uh, 2021 uh, RBB CSC School Board meeting. And, um, before we get into the visitors' comments, I've noticed that there's been some misinformation out, and so uh, in, in order to make sure that information has been corrected, I'd like for Dr. Sanders to uh, kind of go through a few things for us. Thank you. I, I'm going to read a, a prepared statement, but I would be glad to talk to anybody after the meeting also. I can state tonight with 100% assurance that RBB CSC is focused on the following, meeting the academic, mental health, and safety needs of all our students, addressing the loss of instruction caused by COVID-19 during the 2020-2021 school year, implementing safety measures to address the current pandemic situation, implementing our Ready Schools initiative in order to address the future of our students, community, and local businesses. I can also state with 100% assurance that critical race theory has not been on the agenda or discussed by RBB's leadership team. We are implementing SEL strategies in a way that aligns with our local values and Indiana state standards. Social emotional learning is about providing students with the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to be successful and productive citizens in the classroom, the school, and the community. Critical analysis, emotional awareness, problem solving, conflict, conflict resolution, teamwork, and decision making are all examples of SEL. In RBB, SEL is not instruction on human sexuality. We do provide age-appropriate lessons on human sexuality according to Indiana's academic standards. Students and parents are provided an opportunity to opt out of this instruction and be provided a qual quality alternative lesson based on Indiana academic standards. We might hear, you might hear in the public comments part of our meeting tonight or on social media about an opt-out form. Please know that this form is not board approved, is not a board approved document. Legally, we would not be bound to this form. However, RBB already provides students and parents the opportunity to opt out of instruction on human sexuality per state law. More importantly, we want to get to the heart of a concern that has caused a parent to want to complete an opt-out form. As a school corporation, we greatly value our parents as our educational partners. As valued partners, we want to be transparent with our parents. We want our parents to know that they may contact principals and the superintendent when they have a concern. We encourage parents to make the school corporation their first stop instead of social media if they have a concern. We are all part of the RBB family. Certainly, we can all work together uh, for the best interest of our students. And I also have a statement about um, our contingency learning and safety plan. Uh, RBB CSE recognizes that the Monroe County Health Department has the authority to close schools when considered necessary to prevent and stop epidemics, uh, according to India code, Indiana Code 16-20-1-24. In order to do all that we can to keep our students in school, RBB CSC will continue to require masks. Based on legal advice, RBB will follow the mandates and recommendations of the County Board of Health. As in as is the case with the beginning of every school year, 
we spend the first few days and weeks of school adjusting our procedures. Overall, I think we've had a very good few days of school. As I visited each of our schools last week, I could say with great assurance that masks simply were not a problem. We don't like wearing masks, but they really are not a problem. We will get the, these uh, balanced procedures worked out and we will provide our students with plenty of opportunities for mask breaks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, just to reiterate, we at RBV uh, promote uh, inclusiveness, harmonious uh, relationships between people. Um, we try to encourage, what I mean by that is lifeline skills. Uh, those are the th kind of things that we teach. Um, we do not want, or speaking for myself, I do not want us to have materials that um, promote divisiveness, that, that are divisive, that, that um, attack certain people. Um, that's not what we're about. We're about trying to all be living to, together in a harmonious society. So I just wanted to get that out there. So um, at this point, we will have visitor comments. Um, if you'd like to make a comment, we ask that you come to the podium and state your name. Um, and Mr. Irwin will uh, notify you and they'll have a timer there for you for the allotted time period. First person is Josh O. Sounds good. All right. Um, good evening. My name is Josh Oresco. I have two children at Edgewood Primary School. I'm asking you to reconsider your position requiring that all children wear face coverings this school year and revert back to the original plan of this being an optional measure for students. This restriction had previously been communicated to parents as optional, and while we understand circumstances can change, there has not been a meaningful change in evidence that would justify this move for children. Neither myself nor my wife are conspiracy theorists or COVID hoaxers. We both know this pandemic has real dangers. We went through all the recommendations in 2020. We got vaccinated this year. We don't take lightly that this uh, pandemic, you know, it has affected real people in the community. Um, and we understand that we have to balance competing needs. However, this latest push for masking children is not supported by data, science, or an objective balancing of competing needs. The COVID-19 risk for children and spread within schools is very low. Even unvaccinated kids have less risk of severe illness or death from COVID than vaccinated adults. A study from the UK last month showed that kids spread at a much lower rate than adults. Epidemiologist Shemez Ladhani said that kids in schools have very little capacity to infect household members. Public Health England's Dr. Susan Hopkins said kids don't or shouldn't wear masks because risk is low and it could affect their development. According to the CDC, more kids died in 2018-2019 flu season, which was eight months long and considered a moderate flu season year, than have died in uh, one and a half years of COVID. Still, the CDC justifies its mask guidance despite the lack of support from randomized controlled trials. The only RCT to test mask wearing's effectiveness against COVID-19 was a 2020 study in Denmark done by Bundegaard et al. With 4,800 participants, this RCT divided people between a mask wearing group, provided high quality three layer surgical masks and a control group. It took place at a time when Denmark was encouraging social distancing but not mask use. The study found that 1.8% of those in the mask group and 2.1% of those in the control group became infected with COVID-19 within a month and this 0.3% difference was not st statistically significant. That Danish study not only had no significant conclusion about the effectiveness in masks, but also they were surgical masks. Worldwide, only one RCT has ever tested cloth masks. It was 2015, done by McIntyre, and it was done in Vietnam. With over 1,100 participants, it tested cloth, mask, uh, cloth masks against surgical masks and did not feature a no-mask control group. The trial tested the protection of healthcare workers, instructing them to wear their cloth masks at all times, except when they are in the toilet or eating across four weeks. The study found that in the cloth mask group, they were 13 times more likely to develop an, develop an influenza-like illness than those in the surgical mask group, which was a stati statistically significant difference showing the cloth masks were much weaker. What can we conclude from this? There's been very little research done to support the use of cloth masks to, pre to prevent COVID pr spread in schools. In sum, of the 14 RCTs on record that have ever tested the effectiveness of masks in preventing the transmission of respiratory viruses, three suggest, but do not provide any statistically significant evidence that masks might be useful. The other 11 say that they're either useless or actually counterproductive. 
of the three studies that provide statistically significant evidence. May I continue? Are you just got a couple sentences left or another two pages? <laughs> so. I have a little bit more if I'm being honest with you. How many speakers do we have this evening? Three? Yeah. Yeah, we only have three speakers this evening. I would like to continue if the board approves. Um, try to wrap it up in the next minute, okay? Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Not only do we have insufficient evidence that cloth masks in schools are helpful, there's good reason to believe they may be harmful. According to Dr. Marty McCary of Johns Hopkins, some children struggle with masks. Kids with myopia can have trouble seeing because the masks fog their glasses. Masks can cause acne and other skin problems. Discomfort of masks distracts children from learning. Masks can become vectors for pathogens if they become moist or are used for too long. With great airway, with great airway resistance during exhalation, they can lead to greater CO2 in the blood. A critic to that statement might say, actually, studies show this isn't the case. In reality, according to the NIH, only one pediatric study has ever been collected uh, showing physiological parameters regarding mass use for kids, such as gas mixture. And it was based on N95 respirators and not cloth masks. That was Eberhardt. I'm not saying that, yes, kids are pumped full of CO2. I am saying that embarrassingly little research has been conducted to the benefit of kids. In March, Ireland's Department of Health said they won't require masks in schools because they may exacerbate anxiety or breathing difficulties for some students. Some children compensate for this by breathing through their mouths, which can lead to deformity in their mouth and face. Again, not saying that's very prevalent, but neither is COVID-19 for these kids. Furthermore, facial expressions are crucial for human connection as kids learn to signal fear, confusion, and happiness. Seeing people speak is part of phonetic development. All of these risks that Dr. McCary addresses, individually they have a small chance of occurrence, but so does COVID-19 for them. Because there is a remote chance of respiratory illness, we're told to enact measures for our kids for which no substantive research has measured the effects. Still, after all this evidence or lack thereof, we're told to follow the experts and mask our kids. Should we not ask for proof that all important considerations have been weighed for that recommendation just because they're experts? Being an expert in an area means you're capable of conducting research, interpreting data, and making recommendations based on those results. Being an expert in a field of study does not absolve you from the responsibility to use that research and data to make transparent and objective recommendations, nor does it make you an expert in other areas. Epidemiologists are not experts in child development, and pediatricians are not always parents. We as a community elected you, the school board, to make decisions based on the educational and developmental well-being of the students from pre-K to high school. I understand there are very difficult times right now, a lot of difficult decisions, a lot of loud voices weighing in, but I trust and believe that you have the students and community's best interest at heart. I urge you to reconsider this mandate you've placed on all children and allow this measure to be optional within the schools. Thank you. Sean Davis. What was the last one five? Did, Sean, go ahead and do five. You could take your mask off. So okay. Can hear you better. Okay, I'm ready. Thank you. Um, so, I'm here to talk about social emotional learning, um, and, and there's there's a very specific reason. Um, and I've I've emailed all of you some concerns that I had, along with an email exchange, which I do feel like is being addressed. Okay, sorry there. So I, I do feel like it is being addressed to a degree. Um, I do have a, a meeting scheduled with, with uh, um, Dr. Sanders. Dr. Sanders. <laughs> sorry, I was just drawing a blank. Dr. Sanders tomorrow to further discuss. But what what brought me to look into this topic was uh, just an Amazon wish list for my third grade third graders classroom. Um, you know, I've talked to the teacher. I've talked to the principal. You know, she explained that, you know, she should have done a better job vetting the books. Um, you know, they were recommended by other educators, uh, I think potentially any in a university uh, contacts that she had. So, uh, and I, you know, I've got a quote from one of the books that was titled Our Skin, A First Conversation About Race. It says, racism, racism is also the things people do and the unfair rules that they make about race so that white people get more power and are treated better than everybody else. Racism happens in lots of big and small ways. It's all around us, even if we don't always notice it. There are other things from that book that, that concern me, obviously. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the books seem to, to center around some of these topics that are in this critical race theory or, you know, in some of these so social emotional learning curriculums, such as Muslim Girls Rise, Dressed Like a Girl, Julian is a Mermaid, which focused on cross-dressing. Introducing Teddy, a gentle story about gender and friendship, and Pink is for Boys, just to name a few of them. So, naturally I was concerned as a parent, I don't think that those are topics that should be discussed with my nine-year-old child um, in, a, in a school setting. Um, made me very angry. Um, you know, I've talked to, the, to 
Mr. Sanders, I've talked to uh, Mrs. Lee, I've talked to the t his, his teacher. Um, sounds like that list has been pulled down. You know, I challenge you as an administration to implement procedures and processes to, to better vet these, these lists, these books that are entering into the classroom. And if they're being read aloud in the classroom, I have a real problem with that. Um, there needs to be some kind of procedure in place to vet those things before they get into the hands of an eight or nine year old child, or, or younger for that matter. That book was recommended for three to five year olds on Amazon, by the way, that, that I gave you that quote from. Children don't see racism until someone teaches them it exists. And that's a fact. So, I looked into this second steps curriculum that uh, Mrs. Lee had, had mentioned to me uh, with regards to social emotional learning. And on the surface, the lesson unit titles um, for the third grade uh, class were, were growth mindset and goal setting, emotion management, empathy and kindness, and problem solving. On the surface, that looks pretty harmless, right? And I looked at the lesson plans and they looked equally as um, harmless. So. Not many resources on RBB's website. Um, I did happen to go over to MCCSC to look at theirs. Had the same curriculum. And then I happened to look at a, I saw a link there that said um, lesson resources. So I clicked on that. And the topics there were race and ethnicity. A Couple topics from that were teaching about race, racism and police violence. Why teaching Black Lives Matter matters. Let's talk, facilitating critical conversations with students and discussing whiteness. We had religion. One of the topics there was expelling Islamophobia. Ability, which I think focused on disabilities. No real issue there, depending on the context, I think. Class, discussing you know, social class. Again, don't know what's being taught there. Immigration, one of the topics there. Um, 10 myths about immigration and then also Walking undocumented. I mean, let's, let's be real here. Undocumented is illegal, correct? I, I know the, the politicians like to spin it a different way, but you know, it, you're conditioning children to think a certain way. You're trying to persuade them when talking about these topics with them. And it, it aligns with a political ideology that I have a real problem with. Then we have gender and sexual identity. I'm sorry, sir, are these things that you say are on our website? No, 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 these, okay. these are on the MCCSC website that aligned with the second step curriculum that I was told is what was going to be taught here. Now, I'm not saying it is, but that book list that I had from my teacher for, for my third grader kind of makes me think that maybe you are. So, you know, maybe you didn't know. But if you didn't, you need to do a better job of vetting who's bringing these things into the classroom. Thank you. Jordan Neuenfeld. My name is Joe Neuenfeld, and I have been a member of this community for 30 years. Uh, I'm gonna talk tonight in regards to Wellness Wednesdays and Second Steps being dedicated weekly to the SEL curriculum. I'm gonna start off by saying that our teachers are amazing. They are compassionate and generous and love their kids. So I'm curious as to why you cannot stand behind them and trust them to make and teach fundamentals of social emotional lessons without adopting the CASEL curriculum? Why force them and us into a curriculum that we have no control over? You have life skills lining your halls. You teach children about their feelings and emotions from simply being a part of a child's life. Talking to them, hearing from them, supporting them, the way that the teachers in this school system have done for generations. We do not need CASEL in RBB. It is not necessary and only provides division. SEL is a divider. Look at us, all here divided already. You have parents here ready to pull their children because they've lost so much faith in you and your decisions. Today, I've been called a white supremacist, a racist, a homophobe, and a member of the KKK because I spoke out about my reservations against SEL. And honestly, that should be everything you need to know about the division that's going to come from adapting this curriculum. Why even introduce something like that? 
something that from the very beginning you knew would cause an uproar. Now, I'm no longer speaking to you. I'm speaking to every single parent out here tonight. We cannot pull our children from this school. This is our school. Generations of our families have went here. Teachers that were, that were ours are now teaching our children. We cannot give these schools over to our large organizations with hidden agendas and gray areas of ethics and morality. We cannot allow our parental rights to be undermined by our government when our government is not here. We are. You are. We have to stay and stand for what has always been ours. This is a public school, a community school, a school for all the people. And according to Indiana Code 20-30-5-17, like Dr. Sanders said, we have a legal right to choose and opt out and consent to a curriculum that our children are being introduced to. Curriculums not related to academic instruction that attempt to affect or manipulate a child's sexuality, religious beliefs, personal analysis, habits, personality traits, opinions, political affiliation or identities have no place in our school and only cause more division. We are here because we are relying on you to stand up for us. That's what we voted you in for, for us. Not for the people barking down these orders and dangling grant money in front of your face for, for controversial curriculums, but to stand with us, your people, your kids, the ones that have genuine concerns about this. We're asking you to trust your teachers, to unite your community. We need to remove the CASEL curriculum from RBB. Now, I'm the one that submitted the opt-out form. I also submitted it to my parents' teachers, or my children's teachers which seems kind of ridiculous because I never opted in to the CASEL curriculum and I actually only found out about it on the first day at the kindergarten meet and greet where my teacher told me what Wellness Wednesdays was and she's the one that said it was SEL. We received agendas on my first day of school for my first and third grader breaking down second steps and Wellness Wednesdays as a part of their mandatory curriculum. We are requesting that we have alternate activities provided um, as long as the CASEL curriculum is in RBB. And I currently urge parents to do the same because I just fully believe that this is way too controversial for a public school to stand behind, especially when the teachers have been doing such an amazing job at uniting us and loving the kids and showing support and, and showing that diversity is amazing. They've done this for generations. Now I'll cut it short and I just want everyone to know that uh, if you have questions regarding the laws that cover our parental rights and our children's education, so please talk to me personally. I'm happy to share those with you. I also brought copies with you tonight, with me tonight. I appreciate for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for speaking tonight. Um, the uh, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Um, the consent agenda is for approval of our minutes from the July 19th, 2021 regular board meeting. Um, the treasurer's report from July of 2021. Uh, Mr. Dernal, could you read us the claims, please? Yes, gross uh, wages for 7-2-2021 is $547,729.17. Gross wages on July the 16th of 2021 is $514,987.26. Gross wages on July the 23rd of 2021 is $27,423.77. Claims and prepays from July the 1st to July the 31st is $4,040,402.22. Uh, regular claims on 8-16 of 2021, $243,940.73. For Forest Hill vouchers on 8-17 of 2021 is $90,032.32. For a grand total of $5,464,515.38. Thank you, Mr. Colonel. Um, consideration of do donations, we have two. Um, one uh, is for Mrs. Robbins' class, um, and using donors choose, they're going to get a floor cushion, a uh, right wipe big book center, and an area rug. And also, there is a $250 donation from Superior Driving School for the student athletics here at the junior high. We also have personnel, res res 
resignations, retirements, non-renewals, leaves, and terminations, one through 10, and personnel appointments and transfers, one through 28. So do we have a motion on the consent agenda? Moved and seconded. Any questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, Dr. Sanders, was there anything you wanted to call out? And Do any of our principals have any introductions to make? Uh, I think we're good, Mr. Kerr. Okay. All right. Um, now we have the probably the most exciting part of the uh, meeting tonight is the Mustang moment. Uh, Dr. Sanders. Yes. I, while they come up, I just want to say uh, Mustang moment it was a regular part of every school board meeting pre-COVID. Uh, and it was the best part of the meeting outside of maybe my report. Uh, but uh, we had to stop it because of COVID and we are bringing it back. This is our first Mustang moment. And since we're at the junior high, it seemed very appropriate. Mr. Siglin. Um, Dr. Sanders asked me to talk a little bit about what we've had, what we've been, what's been going on here at the junior high uh, from the development. Uh, we had a, a teacher probably two years ago, and that was one of our Mustang moments a while ago where they decided in the classroom that they wanted to, to look a little different or do some, do, do some things a little different. So uh, Ms. Jones put together this process where kids collaborated and they developed what they thought an ideal classroom would look like and so they put together this flexible seating project and from there we kind of reimagined what our library was going to look like and how we were going to use our library as a and we created some collaboration stations uh, in there with a the grant we got through Smithville um, and unfortunately right when we got everything set up in there that's kind of when we got shut down last time and so we're itching to kind of get in there we've used it a little bit uh, but well, I've had some classes in there uh, already today um, and at the end of last year and so you know and then we got the development of this uh, awesome space in here where we're going to be able to use it for you know robotics competitions band concerts choir concerts um, obviously we can use it for athletic uh, practices and, and different events um, we got this uh, I'd call it a world-class maker space over here where we've got the opportunity to to use these tools to plan and then to create um, and then um, you know we've got you know our our um, not Franklin Initiative, but our Teacher of the Year last year, we, we placed her in our media, um, media productions class, and now we've got a TV studio developed in one of our, our classrooms now, and so we've got a lot of cool things going on, um, but when, at the end of last year when kind of we were getting back in the groove of school and we, we knew what kind of we wanted school to, to eventually be and what we wanted it to look like, um, as I was walking down the hall late March or late May, um, you know, I was walking down the hall and I was seeing kids getting together, collaborating, doing things that, you know, a lot of skills that, you know, as adults, things that we want to be able to do or things we want them to do well, well, they've been doing it. Um, and so today we've got um, five, uh, five of our students. We've got Kate Knopf, Ava Norton, Lottie Austin, Grace Thurman, and Gabe Campbell. And they're going to kind of talk about one of the projects, or I think we've got two different projects that they worked on at the end of the year. Um, and then Mrs. Megan Scott um, is with us here too. Um, so they're going to kind of go through the, what they've been doing uh, in our space. Okay. So I am Megan Scott. I'm a Ready Schools coach here at the junior high and I am housed in our wonderful new space that Mr. Seglin was just talking about. So I consider myself so, so fortunate to be able to work with students every day in this imaginative and innovative space and see their creations come to life. So we, um, just a quick timeline of where we are. We just opened about six months ago. Um, so we have just kind of hit the ground running with this. We had um, classes in there before furniture was even in there. The kids and the teachers are so excited to start getting in and getting their hands on these materials and working together. If we can go ahead and move to the next one. So this kind of just shows a progression of the space over time. That's kind of what it looked like up in the top left-hand corner when we first had kids in there. And you can see some of Mrs. Grimes' kids um, using this multi-purpose room for their uh, STEM activity. They were building gliders that they were testing. Um, and then down at the bottom, we have our STEM showcase that we had in the spring. And we also had a teacher training that was for the entire Indiana Uplands region that we hosted here at the junior high as well. So those teachers are from 
a variety of schools all around our area and they came here for two days of training to learn all about all things digital fabrication. So I'm going to just uh, talk to you briefly about these four projects that the students engaged in. And again, this was just in the last months of school. So really neat how they were able to pull these together and kudos to their teachers for their imaginative um, just going after this and wait, not waiting till the next school year, just jumping in. And then I'm gonna turn it over to the students to tell more about these experiences. So this is Mr. Kensick's tiny house class where they are tiny house uh, budget personal finance class where students develop blueprints and um, budgets for their prototypes that they built for tiny houses. This is Mr. Stevens' carnival games where they students went through um, a series of iterations of prototypes testing the probability of their games and making sure that they created fair games that students used at the um, Steam House or Steam Open House evening. This is Ms. Cowden's literacy board game. So the, her students uh, read novels and then created board games that were based on central themes and story arc elements. And then this is Mr. Gallagher's eighth grade geometry class with their kite building. Mr. Gallagher's class also did some carnival games along with Ms. Wells' class as well, but this is the one we highlighted with his geometry students. That's a wind tunnel that they constructed in the middle to test their prototypes. Um, and you can see some of their blueprints and designs that they did here too. We don't have any eighth graders or from last year here with us tonight, so we're gonna focus on the first three. And then the last one I think is just kind of, I don't know if there's one more slide, Mr. Rodden, yeah. So that's just our steam night open house. So I'm gonna turn it over to these students and have them share. I'm gonna ask each of them one question and have them share a little bit about their experiences, okay? All right, Kate, would you come on up first? <laughs> Right? Yeah. Lucky take. So tell us about what you did. So um, in Mr. Stevens' class, I was able to make a carnival game, which we called Duck Pong. It was made out of a cardboard box, and we lined it with tissue paper and cups, which had water in it. And instead of your traditional ping pong toss, where you throw the ping pong ball into the water, we made our own rubber ducks out of egg cartons. In Miss Cowden's class, um, my group read Chasing Vermeer, and we made a game which required you to build a rectangle out of pentominoes in order to like advance in the game. And in Mr. Kensick's class, I made a tiny home, which what like really helped us with like budgeting and learning more about our fi our finances. Uh, definitely teamwork and creativity. We got to be very imaginative and we were able to cooperate very well. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lottie, will you come on up next? Lottie, what would you say that this space allows you to do that a more traditional classroom space you're just not able to do in the same way that you could do in a space like this that you have now? Um, well, okay, so in like a normal classroom, it's kind of, we have these like desks and you know, it's kind of small, but whenever something's like made to do a specific thing, you can really see the intention in it. So in like the STEM lab, is that how you pronounce it? In the STEM lab, it's like a, it's just a bigger area and they, they have all these like these cool things like um, the outlets like hang down. I don't know if you guys have been there, you probably have, um, but yeah, they like hang down and you can pull them and stuff. And some of the tables, I forgot what side of the room it was on, uh, they're like whiteboards. Dry erase tables. Yes. Yep. Um, and you get to draw on them, which is actually really fun. Uh, it does stain sometimes, but you know, you can clean it off. Um, and this is unrelated, but, well, it, it's related, but they have chairs that they, they have tall chairs and small chairs. And in the other room, they have like these tables and they have this huge like saw it's really loud, but it works really well, so. <laughs> Excellent, thanks so much, Lottie, thank you. Mrs. Um, Scott, yeah. can you adjust the yeah. mic when they yeah. come up? Yeah, all right, Gabe, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gabe, what would you tell a student who has never been in the lab about this space? If they've never been here before, sixth grade student, what would you tell them about this space? And you can talk right into here. Um, it's a place where you can really express yourself and you can 
be very, very creative and you can, it's related to your subjects, but it's still very, very fun. And it was honestly one of my favorite parts of the day going to the design lab. I'm going to put that in there. Thank you, Kate. Okay, and then last but not least, Grace, come on up. <laughs> okay, oh, actually, you handled it great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, Grace, what did you enjoy most about the projects that you did and the, the work that you did in the new space? What was your favorite part? I would say I enjoyed uh, the creative liberty of it and getting to make basically whatever I had in my mind. That mostly worked out. Uh, sometimes it didn't work, but that's just trial and error. <laughs> it sure is. Well, I would like to give these students a round of applause. Thank you. So yes, that is our new space. We are looking to engage these students in real world, authentic work where they can have their imaginations go and be able to create whatever comes to their mind. And we're just so thrilled to see them and so grateful for their, their time and thoughts. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next item is the business manager's report. Um, Mr. Irwin. have in front of you the cash flows and I just updated those again from last week when I sent those to you. Uh, so they've been a little bit updated. They've been updated again since the, the form 54 comes out on the 15th of every month. Uh, just starting with the education fund, the revenue side of things continue to roll in pretty accurately. I really haven't changed a whole lot as far as projections go for what the end of the year looks like until we start to solidify our ADM, which obviously we're starting to kind of see what that is. And then we kind of see how the school year settles in and with all of our other grants that make up our tuition support, whether that be the CTE, special education, or honors grant. So again, numbers will move around a little bit as the year progresses and we kind of I update those projections based on what our ADM ends up being, but I'll continue to do that as I normally do with you guys every single month. So we're in a good spot there. Debt service, there's not a whole lot to say about it other than you know, month of July, we made all of our scheduled debt payments. No surprises, uh, which is always a good thing. And we are where we expected to be. And that's a good thing. Um, operations fund, um, it continues to follow the projections that we have pretty closely. We made payments on the uh, buses that we still owe leases on. We also got in money for all the buses. If you remember a few months ago, we surplused a bunch of buses. Uh, if, when we were going to trade those in, we were only going to get a couple hundred dollars total. We were able to, to, to pull thousands off of those by selling them on the public surplus site, which was a huge benefit to the school corporation. And so we were able to get rid of seven old buses to make room in our new lot back there as far as buses go, but also to kind of do better on the finances there than what we were going to get on a trade-in. So we were pretty happy with that. Um, we also received a safety grant disbursement as well. So again, operations fund, year end projections are right there where we want them to be, and we're staying in good shape. So with that, I'll take any questions. How's our uh, current enrollment projection right now compared, compared to what we lost last year, seniors and incoming kindergartners coming in? Uh, we're somewhere in the mid 2600s right now. We ended last year in the mid 2500s as far as total okay. enrollment. But again, that number will slide around as we finish up with, you know, you might get records requests for a student that might be leaving and we didn't know it. We might get new students that come in and then we still have a few parents that are finishing up registration. Okay. Thank you. And what's our ADM day? September 15th. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, um, we'll go into uh, permission to advertise the 2022 budget. Mr. Irwin. Yeah, so I sent you guys uh, a, a quite a bit of information. And obviously, I'll talk about that over the process in the next couple board meetings. With next month, we'll have our public hearing and then we'll have our adoption the month after in, in October. But again, what this does, it just sends out the notification to the public and the taxpayers about um, our estimate, estimated budgets for the year. I plan to put those out on Gateway on around August 26th. Um, statutorily, it has to come out at least 10 days prior to the hearing. We will well exceed that. Um, so that'll be on Gateway. We'll also put the bus replacement plan, capital projects plan. That'll go on Gateway as well, as well as our school website so that people are able to view that. Um, and again, when just putting this together, 
Obviously, we take into effect the new budget that was put in by the legislature. We look at what the max level, the max levy growth quotient was for the operations fund, which was 4.3 percent this year, which means that our levy, our max levy for the operations fund, was able to grow that amount, which is about $200,000. Um, and then we also obviously look at kind of our AV as it's rolled in here later this month or in this month. But when we aver actually advertise the budget, we always advertise high. Because remember, when we advertise the budget, you can advertise high, you can always bring that down. But once you advertise that, you can't go any higher than amount. So we use those DLGF uh, best practices of, of putting the AV at 85% of what last year's was. And then we've worked with Stiefel, which had Blacklock. And then Paul has worked as far as reviewing debt management and operations and all those funds to make sure they kind of had a second eye over everything that I did, um, just to make sure that we're in good shape with kind of coming up with the coming months. So with that, I'm asked for you guys' permission to advertise the budget. We have motion. I'll Moved and seconded. Any questions or comments? And then all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. You may advertise the budget. Um, now, this part of our meeting is uh, for consideration of a project bond. And so as part of that, you open uh, what's called a 1028 hearing. So I will officially open the 1028 hearing uh, for this project. And we're going to start off with Jacob McCollin, uh, Bose McKinney to go through the project. Thanks. The Thank you, Mr. President. So um, as you'll recall, we were here last month to talk about this process. And I'll, I'll touch on the 1028 hearing, the items that we need to address for that, but maybe just high level talk about the next five items so that it all makes sense. Um, so this is um, this and the next uh, four agenda items are the steps necessary um, for the authorization of a general obligation bond. Um, and again, this will be wrapped, so there's no increase you know, in, in your tax rate. Um, this is for bonds in an amount of not to exceed uh, 2400000 with a rate not to exceed 5% and a final maturity of not later than January 15th of 2027. As far as timing, we put out a couple of notices after the last meeting, and that's what these hearings are about. Um, after, this, uh, after this meeting, assuming everything passes, um, we'll put on another notice that you all have determined to issue a, a general obligation bond. Um, Stiefel, um, Matt will put together um, an offering document and we'll look to um, price the bonds. I think we have a bond sale tentatively set for late September um, with closing and funds available in mid-October. So to get back on the, uh, the 1028 hearing, so this is for a project um, which includes the improvement, renovation, acquisition, and equipping of the school corporation's facilities, including but not limited to technology upgrades, including computers, copiers, bell paging systems, and other technology upgrades and equipment, HVAC upgrades and improvements at all the school corporation facilities, the acquisition of new school buses for the school corporation, school corporation parking lot construction, renovation, upgrades, and improvements, and other renovations, improvements, and equipping and upgrades at all school corporation facilities. And again, the, the cost is anticipated to not exceed 2,400,000. And the reason for the hearing statutorily is when a project ex is going to exceed $1 million, you have to hold a 1028 hearing. So with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Matt to discuss the project need. So again, just the need of the project, and he'd already kind of talked about some of the, the purposes of the expenditures for the GO bond. But again, we had done a, a large list of HVAC needs in the past, and that did not cover nearly all of them at all. And so we need to continue to tackle that list um, to provide better heating and cooling air quality in our buildings, better technology for teachers and staff to provide the highest quality tools for the education. You kind of see some of the things that we've been able to do with some of the Mustang moments and other things that we've been able to present. Um, new boat buses to transport our students to and from school as we're looking at here in a couple years, our contract bus routes coming to an end and whether or not we know whether or not they're gonna uh, renew or not. So there's a, a large expenditure there with school buses. Um, updating and maximizing our safety uh, of our school corporation lots and taking care of potholes, resurfacing, resealing, 
striping, all of those things, and as well as any other uh, safety learning environment, educational opportunities that our students need that come along with that. Um, so those would be the purposes of it. In, next, we have Matt Shoemaker from Stiefel, who will discuss the financing of the project uh, and the tax impact of the project. Uh, good evening, everyone. I know I gave this same presentation uh, last month, so I will be brief. Um, but if we can go to the next page. So this shows your current debt, uh, outstanding. Uh, you can see from 21 to 22, uh, your payments are currently uh, scheduled to be fairly level uh, with a drop in 23 and 24. Uh, but because of the significant AV growth that you all have seen the last few years, um, you're actually able to add a payment on in 2022 uh, and stay tax neutral. Uh, if we go to the next page, this illustrates that. Um, so the blue uh, that you see in the bar graph, that is what you saw from the last page. Those are your current payments. Uh, the gray is the anticipated payments from the new bond. Uh, you will see that the payment from 21 to 22 does go up. Uh, it looks like a significant jump, um, but as I touched on, that assessed value is growing so rapidly that you're able to pay a higher levy in debt service uh, and still produce the same tax rate. So the payment goes a little bit higher, the tax rate does not change whatsoever because of the assessed value growth. Uh, we got assessed value numbers uh, a couple weeks ago. You guys grew a little over 9% again, uh, which statewide is phenomenal. So um, again, that's why the payment is going up in 2022, but the tax rate um, imposed on the community will not go up. It still puts you in great position uh, moving forward. You can see that the tax rate is scheduled to drop in 2023 and then again in 2024 put you guys in a great position uh, to potentially take care of some other facility needs um, should they be there uh, this time next year. The next page, uh, this shows your current uh, or your projected total tax rate. So the previous page only showed debt service. This shows debt service plus operations. Uh, as I had mentioned from 21 to 22, uh, you will stay right at the dollar nine and still be in position um, to see some uh, a tax rate drop in 2023 where you can do additional projects, again, tax rate neutral. Uh, the last page uh, shows the parameters that you'll see in the resolutions that Jacob talked about. We showed these last month, but we can go over these again. Uh, so maximum par amount of the bonds, 2.4 million. Uh, estimated cost of issuance, 150,000. This would be upfront professional fees. Uh, the number will likely come in lower than that, but that is just a conservative estimate at this point. That would leave $2,250,000 uh, for the hard and soft project costs uh, that Matt talked about. Estimated interest rates, 4%. Uh, again, a very conservative number. We're expecting this to be in the low 1% when you actually do this uh, come next month, uh, should you proceed. Estimated interest expense, 170,000. When the bonds are actually sold, that number is gonna be significantly less, significantly less. All of these are maximum financial parameters, worst case scenario. Uh, estimated maximum tax rate impact that you'll see in the resolution, uh, 0.153, which is 15 cents on the tax rate. Um, we always list this, uh, has to by, by statute. Uh, this is just a statutory formula. It takes the maximum payment uh, expected on the bonds, divides it by the current assessed value, does not take into account what we've showed, some of your other bonds paying off and your assessed value growing. Uh, now that your uh, AV for next year has been certified, we know what that payment will be next year to keep you tax rate neutral. Uh, so the net impact on the tax rate after factoring in other bonds paying off and your assessed value uh, growing uh, will be zero. It will be tax rate neutral. Your tax rate will not change uh, from this year to next year. That's all I have, but happy to answer uh, any questions that anyone may have. Board have any questions? Nope. Um, this is the Thank point you. of the 1028 year hearing where we open it up for public uh, uh, questions or comments uh, related to the bonding. Is there anyone who'd like to ask any questions or make any comments related to the project bond? Hearing none, uh, I will officially close the 1028 hearing. And we also have to have an additional appropriation hearing. And so I will now officially open the hearing on additional appropriation. And again, I'll call up Mr. Jacob McClellan for, to begin this part. 
Sure, and so the background for this hearing is um, whenever you guys make an amendment to the budget, here you're making an amendment to the budget to pull in the $2.4 million of bond proceeds, you have to hold a public hearing on it. So that's what this hearing does, is it takes comment on um, pulling in the $2.4 million into your budget. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, but. Okay. Um, and Mr. Irwin uh, going to explain, is going to explain for us how the note proceeds will be spent. Yeah, much like I just stated earlier, uh, the proceeds are going to be spent on things such as HVAC upgrades, school buses, um, technology items, whether it's computers, copiers, school, school pe uh, bell paging systems, or any other technological needs that we need for our teachers, students, uh, anything else that improves the safety learning environment and educational opportunities of our students. And those, those are where the, the bond proceeds will be spent um, with this GO bond. Thank you. And so this is the point of the hearing where we can have questions and comments from the public uh, related to the additional appropriation. Anyone wish to speak on that question? Okay. Hearing none, then we will officially close the hearing on the additional appropriation on the note proceeds. Um, now, in order to effectuate all this, we will need to vote on each of the following uh, resolutions. We'll take them one at a time. Um, first is the 1028 uh, resolution for the project uh, that is in your board packets. Did you want to say anything about any of these? I, I think you guys all get it, but this one is just the approval um, of the project for purposes of the statute requiring the 1028 hearing. And it goes through um, what Matt showed you on the screen that, you know, that there is a tax impact, except that there's not because your assessed value has gone up and other obligations will roll off. So there'll be no tax increase to any, uh, any of your constituents. So, okay. We have a motion. I'll move approval. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any questions, comments on the 1028 Mr. resolution? Kerr, I do want to uh, interject. I, I had a nice talk with Mr. Irwin today regarding the what the money is going to be utilized for and I would like I would like to ask and request that the board see a prioritized list before that final decision is made on those items kind of a breakdown of those items mm -hmm. okay. so you've asked him to prepare that yes I did, I did. Okay. Okay. Thanks. awesome anything further hearing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed Motion carries. Um, next is the resolution for the bond. Uh, so this actually authorizes the issuance of the bonds. It goes through all the parameters um, that Matt provided. And again, it's um, you know not to exceed uh, $2.4 million, rate not to exceed 5%. We think it'll be lower than that. Final maturity of January 15, 2027, uh, possibly earlier. And again, timing wise, um, after this, Stiefel will market the bonds and then we'll have a bond sale late September um, with uh, proceeds available um, mid October. So. Thank you. We have a motion. I'll move approval. I'll second. Move and second. Any questions, comments on the bond resolution? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And our last would be the additional appropriation resolution. So this is the final action and, and this just approves the appropriation of the $2.4 million once you receive it into your budget so that you can spend it. So. Okay. I'd move approval. I'll second. Move and second. Any questions, comments? Just to clarify that it's a maximum of $2.4 million and that is not, that's not the actual amount, but it's a maximum of 2.4. Is that right? Correct. That's a not to exceed amount, so it right. won't go Thank any higher than that. It could be that amount. It could be lower. Thank you. Okay. Anything further? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming thank you. Uh, here tonight and explaining all this for us and walking us through this process. Um, so let's see, moving on down, we now have uh, consideration on renewal agreement with adult and child. Uh, Dr. Sanders. Yes, uh, we are uh, beginning our second year partnering with the adult and child mental health agency. 
uh, under the leadership of uh, Tom Norris, our mental health services uh, for students continues to be impactful. Uh, and we appreciate uh, our partnerships uh, with organizations such as Adult and Child. Uh, this agreement is for a split therapist position at uh, Edgewood High School. So 50% of this uh, position is paid for uh, through Medicaid, and the other 50% is paid for through uh, Lilly Grant dollars, uh, Title IV Grant dollars, and also uh, uh, our own local uh, budget. Uh, this agreement has been reviewed and approved by Ferguson Law, and I recommend your approval. Good motion. I second. Any questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, considering continuing in that theme, we have consideration to approve the contract with CLASS. Uh, yes, CLASS, uh, which stands for Connected Learning Assures Student Success, has been uh, implemented in uh, primarily at Edgewood Primary School for the last several years. CLASS utilizes research on how students learn to provide our pr primary teachers with training and best teaching practices. Uh, uh, this agreement will allow CLASS to provide uh, six training days for our primary teachers at EPS. Uh, the uh, cost of the, the uh, six training dates is $9,199 and will be paid for through Title II. This agreement has also been reviewed and approved by Ferguson Law, and I recommend your approval. I move approval of the class contract. I'll second. Is this another SEL curriculum, Brian? Brian, no. this is another SEL? No. Because when you look up CLASS, I'm sorry, the does. public comment period is over. Right. Any further questions or comments from the board? Uh, I would like some clarification from uh, Dr. Sanders. This this is this is different than what was talked about earlier in the, the parent discussion about the Castle curriculum. Yeah. Class has been different? around longer than SEL has been around. It was a. a yeah, yeah, no, it has. It has it's been yeah. around for a while. I just when you look it up, they group. I'm it sorry. The this is the this, board's time. If you could just interject a little bit more, Dr. Sanders, that would be perfect. I'm sorry. If he could maybe help me understand, too, a little bit better, that would be great. The difference between the CASEL is something completely different from CLASS, correct? CASEL is a uh, national organization uh, that promotes SEL. We actually align ourselves with Indiana standards. Uh, and uh, so uh, this has nothing to do with CASEL. This is just in teacher training, correct? Yes. Okay. Any further questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. And our next item is consideration to approve the TIMS uh, grant amendment. Uh, Dr. Sanders? Yes, so uh, as you know, uh, the IU School of Psychology and RBB uh, successfully collaborated on a five-year, two and a half million dollar grant. We are in the second year of the grant. Uh, the, uh, as a reminder, um, here are some of the details of the grant. The grant is uh, through the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, RBB CSC and IU School of Psychology are collaborating on the implement implementation of the uh, of a, the. the uh, state-of-the-art model, a multi-tiered trauma-informed system of mental health uh, support for EPS, EIS, and EJHS. Uh, the goals of the grant uh, are to increase the number of school psychology graduate students placed and retained in RBB schools, uh, receiving training in trauma-informed practice. Uh, the second goal is to improve uh, student me mental health outcomes, achievement, and uh, disciplinary outcomes through the provision of the appropriate Tier 2 and Tier 3 supports. The TIMS grant is enabling RBB to significantly increase the number of RBB students 
receiving direct and evidence-based services. The amendment allows RBB CSC to continue our partnership with Indiana University. Uh, and any student who participates uh, must have uh, parental uh, consent. Uh, Christine Bartlett and Ferguson Law have reviewed and approved this agreement. I recommend your approval. I move um, approval of the Tim's grant. I'll second. Any questions on the Tim's grant? Hear none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, there's also consideration to approve our annual agreement with Ivy Tech, Dr. Sanders. Yes, as stated in the agenda item, this is an annual uh, agreement with uh, Ivy Tech Ter Terre Haute, uh, which enables students to simultaneously be enrolled in Edgewood High School's agricultural program and Ivy Tech earning credits in both institutions. An EHS a teacher provides the instructions instruction, uh, students are not charged tuition. The memorandum of understanding outli outlines the procedures for the dual credit program. We currently have three agri agricultural dual credit courses offered at Edgewood High School. Uh, Ferguson Law has also reviewed this MOU. And I recommend your approval. Make a motion to approve. Yeah. Moving and seconding. Any questions? I'm just excited about how many credits yeah. our students can earn at the college you know, level. Uh, this is just uh, one example of, of that. Um, my daughter, when she graduated, had almost her freshman year done mm -hmm. um, So at, at college. So this is awesome. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, now we have the consideration to approve a Sycamore Drive easement. You know, I say this quite often because, um, and it's just true, we have a great partnership with the town of Ellipsville. And uh, we uh, are partnering with them to um, provide uh, an expansion of Sycamore Drive, which will enable our traffic, buses, uh, uh, cars going through that area to be able to travel uh, uh, more safely. And uh, so uh, would you like to share a little bit about this? My name is Kip Hetty, and I'm the newly appointed street commissioner for the town of Ellsville uh, Public Works. Uh, I've noticed in the last few years myself personally that Sycamore Drive is pretty tight for buses, especially in the morning and in the evenings both, and then you got the parents coming in and out. So the town applies for what they call the community crossings grants every year. Uh, last year, we had almost a half a million dollars awarded to us to resurface streets in the town limits of Ellettsville. This year, I'm wanting to widen Sycamore Drive about another two foot, somewhere around that area. And then uh, the grant probably won't be awarded till about December. So it may not be till next spring before I get the top coat put on the whole road. But I'm proposing to widen from Reeves Road all the way to Cedar Drive in, uh, well, widen to Hickory Drive. Uh, and then after we widen it in-house to the town of Ellettsville doing it, then I'll have uh, an outside contractor through the grant put the top coat on. Um, the first section, I don't know if everybody probably might see when they come in tonight, if they come in from that direction, that we already have right away there from Colt Drive to Hickory. So we were started work there. So this is to go from Colt Drive to Reeves Road on the west side. And then once we're done, we'll, we'll regroom the banks where it's mowable and, and it'll look nice, hopefully. So. Uh, I want to tell you, Kip uh, met with uh, Mr. Caldwell, Arnold Caldwell, our director of maintenance, and Matt Earl, and we met up there and, and talked about it. And uh, uh, I really appreciate Kip's hard work on this and thinking of us. Um, the easement that uh, you're approving is uh, not quite in its final stages. So uh, it, it has been reviewed by Ferguson Law and shared with the town of Ellettsville. Uh, and uh, Christine is here tonight. She's made some revisions and presented it back to uh, the town of Ellettsville for 
final approval. Uh, so it's kind of up to you, I guess, as a board tonight, if you want to approve this pending the final of approval of Ferguson Law, or if you'd like to table it until we have the easement uh, uh, completed. I believe we can move forward uh, as long as it was approved by Ferguson Law um, before it was signed. I, unless there's objection to that from any. No. Mm -hmm. I, I move that we approve pending right. the uh, approval of our uh, uh, lawyer to okay. our attorneys. Yes. I'll second. I also want to uh, tack on to what uh, Mr. Dr. Sanders said about KIP. He, he'd been working on this for well over a year, and we, he and I talked about it early in 2020, and uh, he's just been a real great guy to work with no doubt I gave him a hard time but I like I like to tell him he does a good job too so <laughs> yeah I've worked with him before too yeah. he's a <laughs> great guy a to lot. work with <laughs> three o'clock in the morning yeah. <laughs> okay um any further questions comments I uh I know they already started today on yeah, we, uh, yeah. the stuff there that's at the good. intersection yeah, that's, with Hickory Drive that's what we've got over there. Mm -hmm. From from uh, Colt Drive to yeah. Reeves Road, uh, the property line of the elementaries comes to the center of the road. So uh, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but if it comes to the center of the road, then the right-of-way easement stops at edge of pavement. So what we need is just to add that extra couple foot to get that along there. And I apologize, I was out of the office this afternoon, so I didn't know there was any updates to it, so I can look no, over I, that too as well. So. I, I'm sure it's formality. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. Uh, right. I'm, uh, I'm excited about it. That yeah, is too, yeah. very well, tight. I've got, Dr. Sanders knows, I've got other things going involved. I'll, have you ever told them? Do you mind if I tell Go them? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm looking for funding. Uh, uh, I kind of missed out on the Bloomington MPO of getting funding through them from for federal money. But I'm looking at putting uh, flashing beacons at the school perimeter properties and at let's say seven o'clock in the morning buses start coming in or the parents or teachers these beacons will start flashing they'll will not stop flashing till the elementary routes are done and then pick up they'll happen again in the afternoon it'll come on uh, they'll be uh, wireless they'll be able, I can be able to activate them with my iPad and my truck if it's a snow day I can automatically push the button it's snow day so they won't come on for two hours uh, Wednesdays, they won't come on till you know the the later start on Wednesdays. So that way, if they're flashing all day long, like when you come through Ellsville at the crosswalk there at Heritage Trail, you see them like they see them flashing, and you just, you just ignore them. So these will only come on during certain times of the day when the buses are going in and out. I'm also working. It's, it's they call them a, a hawk system, but it's not a full blown hawk system. But it's a crosswalk with lights here at Colt Drive, and it'll be a hand censored or touchless sensor, sensory, uh, so they can activate and cross the road right there. So I'm working on that. I've been a while working on that, but I hope to get that hopefully in the next year or so or less. So it's all part of the plan of updating the road. Uh, we're gonna resurface Rees Road and Mustang Drive. That's the top three in this area right here. We're gonna try to get resurfaced up here. So. That is awesome, that is awesome. And with the sidewalks, uh, yeah. that we're putting in as well. I mean, it's really doing a, a great job working with the town to keep our students safe. So thank you very much. You. Very much. Anything further from the board? All of those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Okay. Thank you, Kip. Thank, thank you, Kip. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. Um, our next item is consideration to approve updated high school student fees. Uh, Mr. Irwin. Yeah, so we had one change uh, that was made to the high school uh, student fees, and this was for an AP stats class. Uh, the rental for it's $38.45 for the entire year, and it, it is an advanced placement course. Um, the curriculum material charge is necessary for the materials that the students are actually going to need to complete the class, and the class was added late because the teacher needed more time to determine the appropriate materials for this class. Um, just as Dirk stated when we talked on the phone about this, uh, just thrilled to add another AP opportunity for our students. So I ask for your approval of updated fees for the high school. Awesome. Thank you. i make a motion. I'll second. Moved and seconded. <clears throat> Questions, comments? 
we can, uh, glad to see the AP program continue to grow. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And next we have uh, consideration to approve a ca cancellation of a single bus contract. Mr. Yeah, so the circumstances of which this is, is, is happening under is in no way of under bad terms between us and the contractor. Uh, Mr. Grubb is, is kind of in a place where some things he has going on in his personal life doesn't allow him to fulfill the, the contract at this time. Um, and so he's been in, in uh, direct communication, constant communication with Mrs. Myers, our transportation director, to kind of update us on what's going on and what kind of the needs are there. So we're going to be able to absorb the route. Um, he is possibly going to look to help us out in the future and maybe become a part-time driver for us, depending on how things go with some of the things he needs to take care of with his family. Um, but we'll absorb the route um, and be able to continue to move along with it. So it won't change the route for the kids that actually ride it or anything like that. It's just kind of absolving the contract, and then we'll bring that technically in-house. So with that, I ask for your approval. I'll move approval. I'll second. Uh, any questions, comments? We appreciate his many years of service to the corporation. Absolutely. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, next is the consideration to approve a purchase of a bus. So this kind of pairs with the one that we just did, but this is for the purchase of, of Mr. Grubb's bus. Um, we've reached out to Midwest Transit to get a fair market value on his bus, um, and I provided that in the board packet so that you guys could see that. Um, we do have an agreed upon purchase price uh, with him of $13,000 for the bus. Um, and with your approval, we'll move forward with purchasing the bus and then officially moving it into our fleet. I've included it, um, you know, as long as you guys approve it, it's included in the bus replacement plan to go along with what we'll put with that moving forward. So with that, I ask for your approval. I move approval of the purchase of the bus. I'll second. Any questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next is a consideration to approve painting services. Yeah, so during the summer, uh, along with all the long list of things that are going on around here, uh, as far as uh, taking care of our facilities, we were working on trying to get some contractors in here to get quoted out on painting services. It's been a number of years since that we've uh, gotten some things done on some of the painting services, so we had a number of things that we needed to tackle. There was only so many things that our in-house crew with maintenance was able to do on their own. So we created a list between Arnold and I and uh, uh, the building principals as far as what all we needed done. Um, and so looking at that, prioritizing it. And so we brought in a couple of people to come and quote out those jobs. Um, one of them that we, the one that we ended up going with was very reasonably priced. It worked well. A couple of the others were a lot higher and were going to be much more expensive. Um, we went ahead and had them complete that work as it, it was stuff that needed to be done prior to students and staff coming back in the building, whether that be classrooms and some of the other things that they were taking care of. Um, the total completed cost of some of these uh, pieces were below the threshold, but if you take everything together, it warrants just bringing it for your approval just for purposes of making sure that you're aware of how we did it. Uh, but the total came in at $23,085 for the, the painting that was completed. Uh, which is just a small sliver of eventually what we need to get to, but we've continued to compile that list, prioritize that list, and we'll continue to chip away on it. It's something that we already had in our capital projects plan this previous year. It's still in there moving forward, and we'll continue to, to take care of those things um, year in and year out. So with that, I ask for your approval of the painting services and invoices. I have a motion? I make a motion. Okay. Moved and seconded. Um, questions, comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. And now consideration to approve the 40B restatement. So the 403B restatement um, is something that we've been looking at for a little while now. Um, a, a number of years, I think it's been a couple years back now, the IRS mandated a certain form um, that they wanted in a template that was compliant with what it is that they, they've put out. Um, they've given a certain amount of grace time that people could catch up with that. If you didn't put it in the, their template, you were responsible for putting anything into it that they might push out from the IRS. Um, we were able to work with Valak, who ended up restating our plan. We didn't change anything about our 403B plan. It just simply put it in an IRS compliant template. And so as other changes that would come up that the IRS might push out, they'll update the plan for us. 
Um, they didn't charge us for this. Obviously, they, they take care of our 403B services and they make money elsewhere as far as providing their services, but they didn't charge us for this piece individually, which was nice. A lot of other places, like when we went to the IASBO conferences, when you looked at different vendors, a lot of them were marketing, hey, we can take care of this for you, we can take care of this for you, but it was gonna cost quite a bit different and they were gonna send you a separate invoice for that piece. Um, so they didn't charge us for that piece, but they went ahead and they put us in that. So the, what you saw in the board packet is the draft. Ferguson Law was able to look over that draft with your guys' approval. I will let them know that they can go ahead and finalize that draft so that Dr. Sanders and I can sign off on it, and then we'll have that updated in the IRS compliant format. So with that, I ask for your guys' approval. Awesome. I move? I, I move approval. I second. Uh, any questions, comments? There none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Irwin. Um, next, we'll have the, there's no miscellaneous items, so we'll have the superintendent's report. Dr. Sanders. Yes. Um, I'm really glad that the uh, junior high students were here tonight because uh, they are a perfect example of what we're doing in RBB to uh, grow and prepare our students so that when they graduate from Edgewood High School, they are uh, prepared with the skills and the knowledge necessary to be able to go out and make an impact in our community. Whether they're going to college, a military, a trade school, or whatever, our, our goal is to be able to create a pathway from school to employment. And uh, Ready Schools is going to enable us to do that. To be successful at this endeavor, we really need to uh, develop partners in our community. And uh, we just uh, made a presentation. The uh, Ellisville Greater Chamber of Commerce uh, does a power luncheon, uh, I think about every quarter. And we were invited to present last Friday. And uh, in the audience are uh, uh, several uh, uh, representatives of different be businesses throughout our community. And uh, so uh, our plan really to uh, foster and build these partnerships uh, involves connections, conversations, and commitments. So just like at the Power Luncheon, uh, we hopefully made some connections. We told our story about Ready Schools. We uh, told uh, the, the community about uh, what we're doing to prepare students through Ready Schools. And we invited the businesses then to have a conversation with us, to sit down where we could go into a little more detail about what we're doing and the different ways that they can uh, partner with us as a business. And then finally, hopefully get to a point where we uh, make some commitments. Uh, so I want to tell you uh, specifically about one of these examples. In my superintendent's report, I list different partnerships that we have developed uh, this year with the Dementia Mill, uh, Smithville. Uh, last month, we had Hoosier Hills Credit Union here. Uh, and also, we're working with Crane for a, a semester-long uh, internship. But a recent conversation we had with uh, uh, German American Bank is a perfect example where we sat down and we talked a little bit about, once again, what we were doing at RBB uh, in regard to, to um, Ready Schools. And the conversation went towards uh, German American Bank uh, maybe hosting an intern. But the conversation went further because uh, uh, they shared how uh, what their needs are in terms of uh, employees, in terms of uh, how this internship could also help them uh, as a financial institute. And so we kind of uh, worked out a next step plan in terms of um, they're going to come back with a little, did I lose my mic? I promise I didn't do anything. All right, I guess I want me to keep going or? I'm belted out there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so really we, we were able to get to a point where we're gonna get back together 
and we're going to learn how to take that internship program from uh, an opportunity for a student during uh, maybe their senior year to spend a semester at German American Bank, but also take it, uh, have a pathway, well, don't need to talk loud anymore. Thank you. Uh, a pathway then from that internship to actually having a job at German American Bank. And we're, so we want to develop, develop this as a model then for other partnerships. So I was really excited about it, so I wanted to share that with you. Very exciting. Um, also, I wanted to just give you some uh, updates on our construction projects. Uh, up at the uh, Edgewood Junior High School renovation project, uh, that will be completed uh, at the end of this month. Right now, we're working our way through a punch list, and also we had our building inspection, and there were some items that we needed to address from the building inspection. Uh, now, we're required to have those items done by August 24th, but by the end of the month, we should have it all completed. Uh, the Innovative Learning Center is due to be completed uh, end of October, uh, maybe early November. Uh, right now, they're roughing in the interior walls, installing ductwork. Uh, they're working on electrical rough-in uh, for the coffee shop, and if you want to go over, uh, and look at the coffee shop. Uh, the floor has been uh, installed and uh, painting is being done and it's starting to, to come to life there. Um, the uh, new uh, preschool, the addition to Edgewood Primary School uh, has been delayed because of a lack of materials, uh, but the steel finally arrived and it's being set in place uh, uh, this week. Uh, the new administration building and the renovation to the current uh, support services building in the transportation lot, uh, they, those are all in various stages. Uh, the uh, whole project is due to be done uh, hopefully by spring break in March of 2022. Um, right now for the uh, new administration building, we're working through uh, some uh, permit issues but that is supposed to be uh, finished very soon. Uh, they're working on electrical work at the bus parking lot and completing the water line tie-ins, and we are now able to park our buses back there. Uh, but there's still work to be done on the transportation lot. The uh, pool project is uh, an, uh, estimated to be completed uh, about mid-September. Uh, they're completing tile and ceiling work uh, shower installations and working on uh, pool equipment startup. And uh, we're also wait, arrive, waiting uh, on the arrival of our pool air handler. And I shared the board in my weekly review a picture of the scoreboard, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I can't wait to see that in action once the swim season starts. And finally, we have uh, uh, HVAC projects that uh, uh, are kind of ongoing. Uh, we're, uh, sometime this fall, we expect that to be finished. Um, we did have, uh, when we were moving the air handler from the high school gym to the ceiling, we did have a heavy equipment, piece of equipment fall and caused a minor damage to the basketball court, uh, but that is being uh, repaired. Uh, we're waiting on delivery of air handlers for the auditorium and commons area. So that's my report. Um, you said the delay for the EECC preschool is the December 31st, 2021 still the date or has that been delayed? Well, um, that is uh, still the guy, the hope. The hope, okay. I'm trying to find the exact word. <laughs> uh, working uh, with these construction projects, uh, you learn that um, these dates are not written in stone. Uh, but before I, I meant to uh, say one more thing, uh, I did want to thank uh, all the parents who spoke tonight, and I appreciate those parents who come in and meet with me individually. Um, I think it's a testament of what an awesome school corporation we have, that we can share our insights and our, we might have differing opinions, but uh, we work well together 
and uh, I'm looking forward to talking to Mr. Davis tomorrow. Uh, and I invited another parent to email me today to come in and meet with me. Uh, I feel that that's how you arrive at a, uh, the best possible decision is just trying to get as much information as possible. So I just I didn't want to end the night to end without thanking them. Thank you. Um, and we'll have our RBBEA comments. Uh, Mr. Ewells. Well, good evening, everyone. It's August. School's back in. So that means I'm a little more tired. So is everybody else. But that's OK. That's a good thing. I'll take it any time. Uh, I'm just glad to be back in. Glad to see the kids every day. That is a huge change. Uh, all things considered, it's felt pretty normal. It's just good to see them, have them in, and that's going to make a big difference. I don't have a whole lot to say other than that since it's August. Um, seeing the junior high kids, listening to Jamie Miller, who, by the way, is a wonderful speaker. Uh, Mr. Ackman kind of put her on the spot this morning. We had this meeting, and uh, we were in a PLC meeting. It was our, our first meeting, and uh, she was there. And, and uh, if you've been around her, you know he was wanting her to summarize. And by golly, she did a wonderful job in four minutes of summarizing two years. Uh, she's, she's uh, like I said, amazing, to repeat myself. Uh, but what I really mean to that is that we have a lot of options for our kids, it seems like. It seems like we're starting this ramp up, which I think is exciting. Um, so I appreciate you supporting our admin, supporting us with PLC initiatives, the Ready School initiatives. I think a lot of it still comes down to the fact that we're not too big to be impersonal. We're not too small to not have these options for our kids. So I want to thank you and all the admin, admin support for us as well. And we're going to wrap this up so I can go home and get some sleep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir. The, uh, now we're to the board member comments, and I um, can't remember the order I used last time. I'll just start on the far left. Mr. Tucker. Um, you know, I thank, thank the parents for coming this evening. I'm not going to try to pronounce the last name, but Josh O, oh, thank you for coming this evening, sharing your thoughts. Mr. Davis, thank, thank you for the emails. We, the, the board reads every email, but Dr. Sanders usually responds as a group, so that way you're not getting seven different responses. So I, I appreciate you. Bring that to our attention. And thank you to Ms. Neufeld, if I pronounced that right, correctly. So I do encourage you to, to share with the building level administrators, which you have done, and then take it to that next step to see, visit with Dr. Sanders. And everybody needs to work together and try to work, work through their concerns and the differences. So um, we've all had kids, and we all try to do the right thing by, by, by children in the school corporation. Hats off to, to Dr. Sanders and the group. We're in our second year of the Tim's grant. That's I almost forgot about that. The two and a half million dollars a year ago is pretty impressive. So hopefully we'll continue to do good things with the money that has provided us with that and our partnership with IU. Sycamore Drive expansion uh, is phenomenal. I made a huge mistake this morning. I was going to trick the traffic at Ellisville. I saw the I saw that blinker thing on Heritage Trail and I thought it was like taking a picture of my car speeding. So I slowed down, turned left up Reeves Road. I thought I'd just buzz right through here over to Highway 46, and it was backed up with school traffic. And it's, it was, there's just a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving parts. Uh, thanks for the SROs who were out there directing traffic. And I think there might have been a middle school or intermediate school administrator out directing traffic, too. And at least they had a yellow jacket on, which is good, so I didn't hit them. So hopefully that will uh, get smoother as parents get used to the traffic patterns there at the intermediate and primary school. Um, Hats off to all the teachers, administrators, and students for ac accepting the fact that we we have to uh, apply up to the mandate with the health department. Um, Mr. Yule has made a comment every every kid he gets to see every kid every day so far. Knock on wood. I hope it continues because it's it's the most important thing is just to stay in school and keep the keep the kids here in in this building. Um, so uh, continued good wishes to all, and hopefully everybody stays healthy. Mrs. Jacobs. Um, I kind of want to reiterate um, to what Mr. Tucker said. You know, I've been working, I, I'm a healthcare uh, worker, and I've been working through this pandemic for almost two years now. So um, while I understand where you're coming from with the mask um, 
I can also tell you that it's very real what we're going through. It's very contagious, um, and that is on a very personal level of where I work. Um, so we have to follow mandates. Um, we don't have a choice in that. Um, we want to keep our students safe. That's how we feel that we can do it. Um, I understand, though, because I have children in the corporation. My kids don't want to wear the mask either. Um, but we also have to communicate with them and have them to understand why we need to do this right now. Um, and I just hope that you know we can move through you know this year um, and keep in school because that's what our students need. And if it is because of a mask, then it is because of a mask. I want my students in here um, every single day to get their education. Last year it was very difficult for mine. I'm sure it was very difficult for other students. If we can keep them in school as for as long as we can, the better they're going to be. Um, and again, like he said, we do read all of our emails. Um, the board does not interject um, in situations where the, you're getting a reply from your superintendent and, and those sorts of things. That, that's what they are doing. And I know that, Mr. Davis, they've been um, communicating with you, and I'm, I'm confident it's going to be resolved. Um, you know, with your situation. Um, I too am a parent. I've had situations um, that I've been concerned with and it was resolved. Um, and um, so I appreciate you doing, you know, coming out here and talking to us. Um, just give your principals and your superintendent the opportunity to, to work through um, your situation and, and help provide what you need to discuss about your children. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say is that I just, again, appreciate all the donations that we get um, for our corporation. Without them, um, you know, we would have less, and we don't want less for our students. We want everything that we can possibly um, provide for their education. So I really, really appreciate that, um, and I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Durnell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, too, am excited about the uh, upgrade on Sycamore uh, Road there. We have been working on that for a long time. Uh, I also want to thank the parents for coming in. Uh, I also want to suggest if you expect a reply from an individual board member, then you need to address it to the board member, because normally I let Jerry or President uh, Kerr take care of our responses. We don't need five responses going out to parents when we need to be united in what we're thinking. And I appreciate what your, your concerns, and I, I uh, again, I appreciate you coming tonight. On, on a lighter note, we've got football coming up, uh, bands out practicing, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a great fall, no doubt. So that's all I have, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. DeMoss. I, uh, I want to thank Ms. Neufeld for uh, the nice words she said about the teachers at RBB. Um, I was one of those for 32 years. In the 31st year of my career, I had something happen that had never happened before. Uh, one of my students took his own life. And um, it gutted me. I didn't know what I had missed, if anything. I didn't know if there was anything I could have done, if there's something I should have seen. Uh, and it was coincidental with the introduction from the state level of the recommendation that we consider social-emotional learning. Um, some of our students need help that I don't know how to give them. And so I was hoping for the training as a teacher that might help me to help him. Um, and I, I think yeah, I don't know if Castle or Two Step is is the best, but I know that there are students that have problems that students did not have problems when I started teaching 32 years ago, 33 years ago now. Uh, so I, I I appreciate your interest. Uh, please believe that we are also concerned about what our students are learning and what they're going through, and I I will live with that death forever. Um, 
and, and if there's anything we can do to prevent the next one, then, then I'm, I'm all in on that, and I know you are too. So uh, please help us make it better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, social emotional learning is about mental health. It is not about pushing any type of political agenda. Um, the things that you were saying were on MCCSC site, we are not them. That is not who we are. Um, when issues are brought to our attention that, that more political type stuff is, uh, is, is being considered or, or uh, asked for is on an Amazon list, um, we look into that and we take that seriously and we deal with it. Um, we do not, as RBB, want to push any agenda, any political agenda. What we want to do is promote mental health. What we want to do is promote um, students and staff and teachers to be able to have the resources to identify when there's concerns with uh, our students and give them strategies on how to cope and deal with that. Not the kind of things that you that we're, folks were bringing up tonight is not what SEL is at RBB. Um, RBB is all about the mental health and promoting mental health of our students. Um, and so please, if, and I am very glad that we have vigilant parents out there that when they see something, that they think is not appropriate, that they bring it to our attention. And I'm so glad you did. And I encourage parents to have open dialogues with their, with their uh, children to find out what they're learning about in school and things like that. And I encourage uh, parents to have discussions with their teachers and with the administrators and superintendent um, we always talk about how we're a community, and we are a community, um, and I don't think we're as far apart as you may have believed on things, um, especially when it comes to social and emotional learning. Um, my wife is a teacher, and I talked to her about it just before I came to the board meeting, and she talked of it in terms of strategies, how to uh, help uh, uh, students problem solve when they're on the playground and they have a, a disagreement. Those are the kind of things that, and she's a second grade teacher, those are the kind of things that she is doing with SEL. It's, it's not political stuff at all. It, it, it is all about the emotional well-being of the students, social and emotional well-being, how they get along with one another, how they um, uh, again, have strategies to deal with, with, with issues that come up between them and their classmates or maybe things that they can take and apply at home to issues that they may be having at home. Um, we're here for the students. Um, we are not here to push political agendas. That is not who we are. That's not who RBB is. Um, Dr. Sanders gave the list of what we're focusing on because that is our focus. It's not political um, uh, platforms. That is not who we are. We're a community. We're a family. We work together, and we want there to be open dialogue uh, with, with the, uh, our, our, our parents, our, our community members. You know, we're talking about the partnerships that we're doing with Ready Schools, with the uh, local employers, you know, getting our students a, a path to uh, a, a career. Um, what, no matter what that path looks like, if it's straight into the workforce, if it's military, if it's college, if it's trade school, whatever it is, um, we are working to try to find ways to give everyone, uh, all of our students, a path to success. So that's what we're about, is about promoting success, promoting the well-being of our students, um, and, and that's it. Um, those other things, that's not who we are or what we're about. Um, so when it comes to the, the, the mask, I, I, I have uh, looked at all kinds of data myself. Um, I have uh, asked uh, our experts. Um, I had uh, communicated with Penny Cottle. Um, there was this 
uh, video that everybody watched, um, millions of people about, from Mount Vernon, and I've heard rebuttals about that. Um, and right now, I think I'm willing to uh, look at what the uh, CDC, the Indiana Department of Education, the Indiana State Department of Health, the uh, Monroe County Health Department, um, the majority of all of those experts, uh, I'm looking to them for guidance. Um, are there other opinions out there? Sure they are. Um, but and especially when it's in a mandate position, um, I'm not going to encourage our school corporation to uh, break the law and to actually risk being closed. I'm not going to do that. I want our students in the seats. One thing that last year showed us was that the precautions we were taking were effective at school and, and stopping transmissions. Maybe you'll say, well, we wouldn't have had any transmissions anyway. But we didn't have any transmissions that occur at school. Some friends who you know, were hanging out together and things like that had some transmissions. But what we did worked. And so that, what that means to me is that we can keep these kids in their seats <laughs> Uh, this year. Um, uh, the only way I see that we would have to go to e-learning is if there were so many out that it just wasn't practical or we didn't have the staff. That was a problem we ran into at one point last year that we just didn't have staff because there was too many that were out because they had COVID or were quarantined. Um, and so that those were the difficult things. So, um, and not everybody can get vaccinated. Um, you know, there's, there's people out there who have medical reasons that they just can't. And so, you know, and they work for our school system too. So everybody uh, deserves to be protected there. Um, I think that's good enough for the night. I, I appreciate everybody coming. Um, and if anybody ever wants to talk to me personally, I'd be happy to speak with them. Um, so this meeting is adjourned and you all have a wonderful evening.